Liberal Viewer presents. So, welcome to the December 3rd edition of Liberal Viewer Sunday Live Clip Roundup. Thanks for joining me. I picked out the weekend's 17 best, most newsworthy clips for what should be a really educational, informative, fair use media criticism and political analysis show for you all tonight. Uh, the political comedy that I will be starting off the show with, and I'll have one a little later in the show, all comes from Saturday Night Live uh, last night on NBC. Uh, I'll have Alec Baldwin as Donald Trump in the cold open, uh, in the cold open uh, looking for the ghosts of Christmas uh, past, present, and future, uh, or at least uh, one ghost of Christmas will be coming up to scare Donald Trump in the cold open. Then I'll have some weekend update clips. But as usual, most of my clips come from the big five corporate outlets of ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, and Fox News, the so-called corporate media here in the United States. You can see the two topics I'm covering listed down in the video description. Uh, basically, it's the big Flynn flip, the big Russia scandal development this week that uh, former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn pled guilty and is cooperating with the special counsel Robert Mueller. And then I'll have uh, four clips, I think, at the end on uh, the ta big tax plan that was passed in the Senate. Some people have asked me to try to cover some of the real issues, the substantive policy issues, and not get so caught up on the Russia scandal and the... Uh, the sexual harassment scandals that have been going on, uh, but uh, the list of the clips I'm using is also available down in the video description. You can see the 17 clips uh, if you want to follow along and try to understand my cryptic notes. Uh, you, you can probably figure out uh, at least uh, who's speaking in each of the clips and what the topic is in each of the clips. Uh, and I, if you're watching this as a recorded show, I'll put time indexes between the topics if you want to skip between them. Uh, but like I said, the first big topic, uh, the bombshell news this week that uh, General Michael Flynn, former National Security Advisor, has pled guilty to one count of lying to the FBI and that he's cooperating with the special counsel. And that is a pretty scary Thing that a uh, pretty scary prospect for Donald Trump, which was uh, the subject of the cold open at the beginning of Saturday Night Live, and I took about a 90-second clip from that, which I will, uh, which I think is uh, pretty funny, with between Donald Trump, played by Alec Baldwin, and Michael Flynn, played by Alex Moffat, uh, over in this clip. <laughs> Donald J. Trump! Donald J. Trump! Oh God, you're going to get me, I knew it. It's the Muslim stuff, right? No. It's for calling Mexicans rapists? No. The Roy Moore stuff? No. Draft dodging? No. The Bertha stuff? No. Pocahontas? No. The Central Park Five? No, wait! Making fun of the handicapped reporter like this? No, sir! <laughs> sir! I'm not here for any of that. So who are you, Jacob Marley? You've got a lot of chains on. No, I'm Michael Flynn, the ghost of Witness Flipped. <laughs> Mr. President, I came to warn you. It's time for you to come clean for the good of the country. The what? The good of the? The good of the country. The good of the come come? <laughs> this is serious, sir. The FBI got to me. Before all this, I had a great life, Donald. I was an honorable, twice-fired military man who loved to talk about how Hillary Clinton had a child's sex ring in a pizza shop. Oh, Mike, you were my man. You led the locker-up cheer at the convention. Who knew you had so much dirt on you in your past? If only somebody had warned me about you. Well, President Obama did tell you not to hire me. I meant someone who's American. <laughs> Mr. President, there's a lot of people from your past that could come back to haunt you. Tonight, you will be visited by three of them. There's the first one now! <laughs> and if you want to see the three uh, ghosts that come and visit Alec Baldwin as Donald Trump, you can see the entire video at a link down in the video description. But I think that uh, the uh, real trouble that Donald Trump is in has gotten into the cultural zeitgeist as represented by uh, Saturday Night Live in that last clip. Uh, I thought that that was one of, Donald, uh, one of Alec Baldwin's better impressions of Donald Trump. Uh, and I'm going to get to the all five of the big five corporate outlets uh, news summaries of uh, what went on uh, this last week. And they all kind of mixed the Flynn flip with uh, the 
text program passing and so I wanted to take a quick joke from Saturday Night Live's Weekend Update that sort of shows that same mixture and then I'll get to the real news clips uh, but here's a quick uh, 24 second clip from Saturday Night Live last night over here. Well, the good news for President Trump is that his tax plan just passed the Senate. The bad news is he might not be president long enough to sign it. <laughs> Former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn pled guilty to charges that he lied to the FBI during their investigation of Trump's ties to Russia. Or as Fox News reported it, did Hillary Clinton secretly join ISIS? <laughs> And I will have the Fox News coverage, which isn't quite as bad as the did Hillary Clinton secretly join ISIS. The Fox News Sunday summary, though, I think has a lot more of the Trump spin in it than any of the other four outlets. Uh, the best one, as usual, is the first one I'm going to show you, NBC's Meet the Press. Uh, Chuck Todd uh, does what you saw in that Saturday Night Live weekend update clip, m clip. Most of them, to some extent, mix the text news with other news, uh, like a big high, a big low uh, for... Uh, Chuck Todd on NBC's uh, Meet the Press. You have the two big stories, the Flynn flip and the tax plan, But uh, and there's a little bit on the tax plan, but it's mostly on Michael Flynn. And uh, this is about four and a half minutes. Uh, I will discuss it with you after we watch it together over here. Two huge stories we're dealing with this morning. One is the tax plan passed by Senate Republicans overnight Friday into Saturday, a bill that Democrats point out favors the wealthy at the expense of parts of the middle class, while Republicans insist the bill will pay for itself with economic growth. The other big story is former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn pleading guilty to lying to the FBI about conversations with Russia's ambassador to the United States during the presidential transition. Now, yesterday, President Trump tweeted that he had to fire Flynn in February because he lied to Vice President Pence and the FBI. That tweet, of course, suggests the president knew Flynn lied to the FBI when he asked FBI Director James Comey to drop the Flynn investigation. So, in an attempt to clean this up, Mr. Trump's personal lawyer, John Dowd, says, is taking the fall and says he actually wrote the tweet. We have gone back to Mr. Dowd and asked him how many times he's tweeted for the president, and he has told us just once, and he said it'll be the last time he does it. Nevertheless, what Flynn's guilty plea tells us definitively is that what the Trump campaign and administration have been saying about a Russia connection for the last year plus doesn't appear to be true. Why would there be any contacts between the campaign? I can't think of bigger lies. There is no connection. We have no dealings in Russia. We have no projects in Russia. We have nothing to do with Russia. Right, those conversations never happened. I have nothing to do with Russia, folks, okay? Now, Flynn's cooperation deal, which makes him special counsel Robert Mueller's star witness at this point, suggests that Mr. Trump's transition team was running a rogue foreign policy operation, and it brings Mueller's Russia investigation straight inside the White House. What has been shown is no collusion, no collusion. Michael Flynn was a top surrogate for Mr. Trump on the campaign trail, introducing him at rallies nearly two dozen times, even floated briefly as a possible vice presidential running mate. He's a great general, great guy, great man. How good is General Flynn? Is he good? As national security advisor, one of the president's key confidants. General Flynn is a wonderful man. Flynn's guilty plea was part of a deal to avoid more severe charges for himself and his son, signaling that he has valuable information about the president's inner circle and even Mr. Trump's family members that he is willing to share. He is pleading to a really very minor charge, considering the scope of all of the exposure that has been reported. Flynn admitted to lying about two separate contacts he had in December with then-Russian ambassador to the United States, Sergei Kislyak. The first on December 22nd, when prosecutors say Flynn was directed by a very senior member of the presidential transition team to urge foreign governments to oppose a U.N. Security Council resolution against Israel. Sources tell NBC News that the senior official was the president's son-in-law, Jared Kushner. A week later, after President Obama announced new sanctions against Russia for interfering in the U.S. election, Flynn discussed what, if anything, to communicate to the Russian ambassador about sanctions with another senior transition official at Mar-a-Lago. We have learned that official is K.T. McFarland. Flynn requested that Russia not escalate the situation, and Russian President Putin said he would not retaliate, prompting Mr. Trump to tweet, 
Great move on delay by V. Putin. I always knew he was very smart. Top members of the White House, including the vice president, later said no sanctions conversation had ever taken place. They did not discuss anything having to do with uh, the United States' decision to um, expel diplomats or, or uh, impose a censure against Russia. So the subject matter of uh, sanctions or the actions taken by the Obama administration did not come up in the conversation. In February, the president said Flynn was fired for misleading the White House about those contacts. But the plea deal suggests that members of the president's inner circle did know about the conversations at the time. What's unclear is if Pence and Priebus were a part of that inner circle. Last week, after Mr. Flynn's legal team stopped cooperating with his own lawyers, the president made a not-so-subtle jab at his former confidant. Even if they're allies, you never know about an ally. An ally can turn, you know what I'm saying? You've got to find that out. And on Saturday, we saw more evidence that the goodwill is over. We'll see what happens. Joining me now is Republic. So that's the NBC Meet the Press uh, summary, and uh, it, I, I think it did it the right way. It concentrated on the big news. There was a little bit about the tax plan passing, uh, but it just passed the Senate, so it, it's not even law yet. There, And I will have a few clips on that at the end, but uh, I think it gave most of the salient facts about what happened with Michael Flynn this week. Uh, the same is true of the news summary from ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. This one has a little bit more flair, I guess, uh, in that it starts off with like the literary reference to Dickens, best of times, worst of times for the Trump administration, which kind of makes sense. Also talks about the Flynn flip, and there's a little bit on the tax plan, but then focuses on Flynn, and uh, then does it, in, I guess, in sort of a Socratic method with a series of questions. Uh, and what I kind of like about this is that I think it pretty much lays out obstruction of justice without actually calling it obstruction of justice, so that the viewer can come to their own conclusion, I guess, which uh, you can let me know what conclusion you come to uh, as we watch that ABC summary of the news of the week, uh, which I will discuss with you after we watch together here. President Trump Friday must have felt like a scene straight out of Dickens. The best of times, Senate Republicans delivered Trump's biggest victory yet, passing the tax bill with two votes to spare. The worst? Just hours before, when the White House learned from TV reports that former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn had cut a deal with Robert Mueller. It was the most seismic move yet in the Russia investigation. Never before has a special counsel reached so deep into a White House so early in a president's term. The big question now, is Flynn's plea the beginning of the end of Mueller's investigation or the beginning of the end of Trump's administration? It all depends on what Flynn knows, what he tells, and how the president responds. He was once a Trump favorite. We have a great general with us, General Flynn, General Mike Flynn. General Flynn, another man who's just so incredible. I love General Flynn. On the shortlist for vice president, a star at the convention. Yes, that's right. Lock her up. But after that subdued and stunning court appearance on Friday, General Michael Flynn may now be Trump's biggest fear. The trouble began just four days into Trump's presidency when Flynn was interviewed by the FBI about contacts with Russia. Flynn was asked about his conversations with the Russian ambassador during the transition. Did he discuss sanctions imposed by President Obama for election meddling and lobby Russia on a U.N. resolution critical of Israel? Flynn denied it then, but in Friday's plea agreement, he admits he was lying. And according to court documents, Flynn coordinated those contacts with others on the transition team getting direction at one point from a very senior member, identified by ABC News as the president's son-in-law, Jared Kushner. Overnight, the New York Times reported that it wasn't just Kushner. K.T. McFarland, Reince Priebus, Steve Bannon, Sean Spicer, and Tom Bossert, among those on the president's transition team who knew about Flynn's outreach to Russia, according to emails obtained by the Times. But did Trump himself know? Did he direct Flynn to have those contacts with the Russian ambassador? Back in February, the president denied it. No, I didn't direct him, but I would have directed him if he didn't do it, okay? Will Flynn contradict the president? And if there was nothing wrong with Flynn's contacts, why did he lie about them to the FBI? Just two of the key questions yet to be answered. Number three, did Flynn promise incriminating information on President Trump or others in Trump's inner circle? How much does he know about other contacts between Trump's team and Russia, especially during the campaign? And why was the president so reluctant to fire Flynn and seemingly trying to protect him? 
Just two days after Flynn's January interview with the FBI, Acting Attorney General Sally Yates warned the White House that Flynn was vulnerable to Russian blackmail. Despite that warning, Trump did not fire Flynn for another 18 days. At the time, the White House said Flynn was fired for lying to the vice president, who repeated those lies in public. I talked to General Flynn about uh, that, uh, that conversation. They did not discuss anything having to do with uh, the United States' decision to um, expel diplomats or, or uh, impose a censure against Russia. The day after Flynn's firing, that infamous meeting with FBI Director James Comey, who says that President Trump told the vice president and others to leave an Oval Office meeting so he could ask Comey to let the Flynn investigation go. I understood him to be saying that what he wanted me to do was drop any investigation connected to Flynn's account of his conversations with the Russians. Trump denies that account. But did Trump want Comey to drop the investigation because he knew Flynn had lied to the FBI? Just yesterday, Trump appeared to say yes. Here was the tweet. I had to fire General Flynn because he lied to the vice president and the FBI. So let's talk about this now with two legal experts. And of course, uh, as you saw in the other news story, that uh, that last tweet there, apparently the, the president's lawyer is claiming to have written that last tweet which uh, after i showed the fox news summary uh, in just a minute where they also uh, make that claim i'll explain why uh, that's kind of problematic although i'll also have a clip in a few minutes of adam schiff explaining why uh, he thinks it's especially problematic which is more important than my opinion since adam schiff is the ranking democrat on the house intelligence committee and he has a lot of insight into these matters but uh, i have two more news summaries i want to show uh these uh, are, sorry, three more. Those were the two best, the NBC and the ABC. Uh, the CNN one is okay. It's uh, a little bit short. It's only 90 seconds long or a little under 90 seconds. And the State of the Union, uh, I think, could have been more dramatic than trying to keep up with the news. And it has the tax plan. It has the Flynn flip. But uh, a few less details. Uh, I guess it's just sort of a brief introduction. Uh, the, you know, there's certainly more in State of the Union, but this is Jake Tapper's introduction. State of the Union, keep trying to keep up. Hello, I'm Jake Tapper in Washington, where the State of Our Union is trying to keep up in this insanely busy news week, with Republicans now just inches away from passing their tax bill, which will have profound consequences for the public. This morning, President Trump is focused squarely on discrediting the Russia investigation. He was up rather early sending his first tweet at 6.15 a.m. Eastern about former FBI Director James Comey, saying, quote, I never asked Comey to stop investigating Flynn, just more fake news covering another Comey lie, exclamation point. The president, of course, is prone to twisting the truth when defending himself, but let's be clear, Comey said in his sworn testimony, under oath, based on contemporaneous notes he took and shared with close advisors, that the president privately told him, quote, I hope you can see your way clear to letting this go, to letting Flynn go, he is a good guy. I hope you can let this go. Now, this all comes after President's, President Trump's former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, pleaded guilty Friday to lying to the FBI about his contacts with the Russian ambassador. Flynn has now flipped. He has agreed to tell the Mueller team what he knows. And the president felt compelled to weigh in on that as well, tweeting Saturday that he, quote, had to fire General Flynn because he lied to the vice president and the FBI, unquote, a tweet that would seem to suggest that if he asked Comey to back off, he already knew Flynn had committed the crime of lying to the FBI. And now questions are swirling over what the president knew and when. There's a lot to discuss with my guest, Democratic Senator Mark Warner. And I'll have uh, Mark Warner clips, a uh, couple of Mark Warner clips from Jake Tapper in just a couple minutes. Uh, and uh, I mean, the one good part of that CNN uh, clip, you can see CNN is pretty much at war with uh, Donald Trump uh, that uh, that when uh, Jake Tapper is talking about the credibility uh, the the credibility of Trump versus the credibility of James Comey. He talks about how Trump has been known to twist the truth. Uh, I mean, they're basically ready to call Donald Trump a liar, and he does seem to tell a lot of lies, uh, even for a politician, more so than uh, even the politicians we've been used to. I mean, it's hard to keep up, but... Uh, those were the three that uh, I would say are on the good side. The The next clip is actually CBS's Face the Nation, uh, which is still, you know, not bad. But uh, they, they uh, in John Dickerson's introduction, they talk about 
a whole bunch of other issues. They even started off with uh, John Conyers and the sexual harassment issue, which uh, has kind of been overtaken, I think, by the other news, even though it was the topic of my Sunday clip roundup the last two weekends. Uh, I think that, uh, I mean, there is still ongoing news on that. But uh, at least I think the John Dickerson on Face of the Nation that he did cover you know, most of the important facts and didn't completely spin it the way the Trump administration would spin it, as you'll see in the Fox News Sunday clip afterwards. But here's the CBS Face the Nation news summary, uh, two minutes over here. Nation, I'm John Dickerson. We knew it would be a busy week when Congress and the White House returned to Washington Monday, but we had no idea just how busy. More stories of sexual misconduct on the part of the longest serving House Democrat John Conyers and now others prompted more calls for Congress to do a better job of policing its own. North Korea fired another missile, one that in theory could reach Washington. It is a situation that we will handle. President, tonight I Progress on the tax bill continued at a brisk pace after Senate Republicans cut a number of deals to gain its passage, which thrilled the president. People are gonna be very, very happy. They're gonna get tremendous Tremendous tax cuts and tax relief. That remains to be seen. Unsurprisingly, Democrats were not happy. Montana's John Tester tweeted a show and tell of the massive bill. This is your government at work. Here's the bill as it's written. Here's the modifications that are in it. I can read one word. It's called add this language. Can you tell me what that word is? Friday arrived with a big development in special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation into possible Trump campaign collusion with the Russians and obstruction of justice, as Michael Flynn pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI and said he's cooperating with Mueller. The president further muddied an already complicated story with a Saturday tweet that seemed to suggest he was aware of Flynn lying to the FBI at the time when he was calling the investigation a witch hunt. I had to fire General Flynn because he lied to the vice president and the FBI. He has pled guilty to those lies. The day after the president fired Flynn for lying, former FBI Director James Comey says the president asked him to go easy on his investigation of Flynn. Sources tell CBS News that the tweet was drafted by one of Mr. Trump's attorneys. We want to take a closer look. So you see, face the nation, at least uh, they don't completely spin it towards Trump the way the Fox News clip I'm about to show does, but uh, they do end with the idea that it was Trump's attorney, not Trump, that tweeted that uh, admission that Trump knew that Mueller had lied to the FBI when he fired him, which makes the obstruction of justice charge so much stronger, uh, as you saw in the previous clips, and I'll show some uh, clips of the newsmakers talking about that in a minute. Uh, and also you notice that Face the Nation spent less, less than half of that two minutes on uh, the Flynn guilty plea. They spent a lot of time on the tax plan, which, I mean, it is going to be important if it passes. There's still time to cover it, I guess. And they did, uh, John Dickerson, to his credit, did show that John uh, Tester, Senator John Tester clip, uh, where he's complaining about how all this stuff was scribbled into the tax bill at the last moment. Uh, and that's the clip I'm going to show of Mitch McConnell in a little bit uh, talking to George Stephanopoulos about that John Tester viral video. Uh, but before I get to that, uh, I have several more clips on the Russia scandal and the Flynn flip. And the last of the news summaries is from Fox News Sunday, where you'll see, uh, first of all, you know uh, that uh, I guess this is kind of a, an annual thing that's long planned, but it seems like when Republicans start getting uh, traumatized, they they withdraw into Reagan world. This has been something you've seen. Uh, they're, they're always talking about St. Reagan. And so I guess, uh, like I said, I think it's been long planned, but it's a kind of symbolic of the way Republicans react that Fox News has withdrawn to the Reagan library in uh, Simi Valley, California, this weekend to talk to all the experts about you know big important national security issues and so we can avoid what's going on with uh, our terrible president and his terrible Russia scandal uh, but they do get to it uh, with reporter Kevin Cork after this introduction from Chris Wallace there there's a lot of uh, Trump administration spin in here uh, 
in the Kevin Cork report, I think, however, uh, this is clip seven, and uh, the, you'll see he talks about, like, how uh, critics say that uh, his tweet is an you know an admission that he knew that Trump uh, Trump knew that Flynn had lied to the FBI when he fired him, uh, or there that's what his tweet said. You know they never, I mean they're saying it's like what critics say when it's actually the plain meaning of his tweet. But anyway, I'll have a maybe another criticism after we watch this Fox News summary of the week. Like I said, starting in their little Reagan cocoon where they feel safe, I guess, over here. Fox News today in Simi Valley, California. I'm Chris Wallace and welcome to a special hour of Fox News Sunday from the fifth annual Reagan National Defense Forum. Key players in national security, including top administration officials, members of Congress and military leaders, came here to address the state of our national defense. This hour will share highlights from the forum including a conversation with Reagan's Secretary of State, George Shultz, about the art of negotiating. One of the Republican leaders in the Senate, John Barrasso, joins us to discuss Senate passage of the GOP tax plan and what comes next. And we'll ask President Trump's National Security Advisor, General H.R. McMaster, about Michael Flynn pleading guilty to lying to the FBI in the Russia probe. We begin there with correspondent Kevin Cork live at the White House, but how the president's inner circle is handling the Flynn news. Kevin. Chris, a Twitter storm early Sunday with the president tweeting several tweets about the FBI, calling them inconsistent and unfair in the ongoing Russia probe. But the White House also found itself trying to save yet another self-inflicted Twitter wound, this time not over the substance of what the president had to say, but rather over the style and the lack of nuance in social media, which is raising all sorts of serious questions. The president tweeted, I had to fire General Flynn because he lied to the vice president and the FBI. He's pled guilty to those lies. It's a shame because his actions during the transition were lawful. There was nothing to hide. But in Washington, that statement set off alarms with critics suggesting that the president's tweet means he knew Flynn lied to the FBI when he fired him. There are reports that the president's personal lawyer, John Dowd, is the one who crafted that tweet and did so in a, quote, sloppy manner. The president adding this. I never asked Comey to stop investigating Flynn. Just more fake news covering another Comey lie. All this as his former national security advisor faces time behind bars for lying to the feds, investigating possible collusion with the Russians in an effort to affect the 2016 election. Yes, that's right. Lock her up. Chance of lock him up, an obvious twist on the now infamous lock her up chant at the RNC last year. That chant led by Flynn in which he suggested that Hillary Clinton should be locked up for her role in the private email server scandal that overshadowed the campaign. General Flynn continues to cooperate with investigators. He faces a sentencing hearing in February. The president says they're not going to find any collusion, Chris, because frankly, there was none. Chris? Kevin Cork reporting from the White House. Kevin. Th <laughs> so, yeah, you can see that uh, the Fox News report has a lot more pro-Trump spin in it there than the other four reports, even more so than the CBS report, which uh, I didn't think was that great for the reasons I previously explained. Uh, you saw that uh, they were uh, basically buying the the idea that the president's lawyer had sl had written that tweet and in a sloppy manner and so they were I think it, that was the report that most discounted the idea that there was an admission from the president that he knew that Flynn lied to the FBI when he fired him and if you watched all the timelines and all those different reports that really makes the obstruction of justice case much stronger because it, when that means that when Trump went to Comey and said, "Can you go easy on Flynn? Uh, can you let you know let it go, let the case go on Flynn or you know whatever?" Uh, it, he said exactly there. It he knew at the time that uh, Michael Flynn had legal liability for lying to the FBI, so he was basically trying to stop the prosecution of a crime that he knew about, which that's obstruction of justice. Or if you look down in the video description, by the way, I have several different sources of, uh, 
uh, legal knowledge uh, about obstruction of justice and some of the I think I have also the the crime of uh, someone from uh, a foreign national giving something of value to a political campaign I have that statute down there I have a report from the Cor Congressional Research Service uh, talking about different ways that obstruction of justice are charged this is a time to start learning about that uh, I, I don't know maybe the Democrats will take over the house and uh, I'll be able to live stream some impeachment hearings that would be uh, that would be awesome I, I would really enjoy doing that and that looks more and more possible uh, with this uh, Michael Flynn guilty plea and cooperating and uh, the one of the things about the guilty plea that uh, it's for a very small charge even though Michael Flynn had a lot of legal liability and that means that he must be giving a lot of help to Robert Mueller the special counsel uh, and that's not just my opinion that's also the opinion of Adam Schiff the ranking uh, Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee and that's the next clip I want to show you this is about a minute long talking to George Stephanopoulos on ABC's This Week about whether this both of these questions from George Stephanopoulos I'm about to show to Adam Schiff are kind of softballs this is like were you surprised by the plea and he says no not surprised but uh, this is what he thinks it means in this clip. And Dan Abrams, so you've been following this for quite some time, investigating it on the House Intelligence Committee. Were you surprised by the plea deal on Friday? I wasn't surprised uh, by the plea deal. Um, the fact, though, that it, it was cabined to one offense uh, with uh, essentially multiple lies in that one offense does tell me as a former prosecutor that uh, given the much broader universe of potential liability here, that Bob Mueller must have concluded that he was getting a lot of value in terms of General Flynn's cooperation. General Flynn, obviously, not a minor character here. Uh, so I think this is very significant. I think the fact that in his uh, factual basis for the plea, he sets out that he wasn't acting as a rogue agent, that, in fact, he was acting with the knowledge and at the direction of people who were senior members of the transition team, I think probably all of which uh, ultimately ended up in the administration uh, is very significant, um, and I think uh, it, it indicates, to me at least, that this is not the end of it by any means. What about that tweet yesterday from the president? Hmm. And I'm going to have that next question in just a second, uh, but I wanted to show that one clip as to, you know, that is the significance of the Michael Flynn guilty plea. I mean, there are only a few people who are bigger fish than Michael Flynn that would allow him to get such a sweetheart deal from the special counsel, Robert Mueller, uh, I mean, it's basically Jared Kushner, uh, Reince Priebus, uh, Donald Trump Jr., Donald Trump himself. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'm trying to think if it, may, it might be one more person, but the, those four and maybe one more person that I'm not thinking of are like the five people who uh, are the higher ups that Michael Flynn could be flipping on. And. I get, we may find out, it, I mean, from his, uh, even from what is in the information that he pled to, there are two other officials, KT McFarlane and Jared Kushner, who both could have, they, they could be like the next dominoes to fall, especially Jared Kushner. Uh, I, and I even saw some uh, news reports that that might be coming up in the next week, the Jared Kushner in the next, sometime in December. Uh, that could be an even scarier prospect for uh, the Trump administration. But uh, the next thing I want to show is this Adam Schiff clip where he talks about Donald Trump's tweet where he basically admits that he knew that Michael Flynn was had lied to the FBI at the time he fired him, which, as I explained earlier, really increases the obstruction of justice evidence against Donald Trump. And... Uh, Adam Schiff has this point I didn't hear anyone else making about how in some ways it's actually worse for Donald Trump if his uh, lawyer, uh, what was it, Ed Dowd, I think his name is, uh, wrote the tweet instead of Trump because the lawyer actually should have all this information. And uh, I mean, there is one more uh, innocent explanation I'll discuss with you after we watch that clip together over here.
from the president, who we now have been told that, uh, according to the White House, it was drafted by his attorney, John Dowd, uh, not the president, but the tweet right now still stands. Well, to me, George, actually, it is more significant if it's coming from the lawyer. Uh, the president has shown every ability to uh, prevaricate and dissemble on this subject. But the lawyer uh, is going to take not only the president's account uh, into play, but also others that he has interviewed. Uh, and this means that uh, what the attorney is saying is consistent between the president and the staff. The president knew he had lied to the FBI, uh, which means that when he talked to the FBI director and asked him effectively to drop this case, he knew that Flynn had committed a federal crime. So it, to me, frankly, it's more serious uh, coming from the attorney than it would have been just coming directly from the president. We also have this report in the New York Times today showing emails during the transition which indicated that many others knew about these conversations that General Flynn was having with the Russian ambassador, including this key T. McFarland email where she says if there's a tit for tat escalation, Trump will have difficulty improving relations with Russia, which has just thrown the USA election to him. The White House is saying that she was interpreting the Democrats' uh, view of these matters. What, is, what do those emails tell you about uh, the possible case that Mueller has? Well, we have to remember the context here, uh, which I think goes a lot to explaining uh, why Flynn lied, and that is the Russians had just helped Donald Trump in the presidential election. And immediately thereafter, President Obama sanctions Russia, uh, Russia over their interference in our election. And you have Flynn, one of the president's top people, basically telling the Russians, don't react to the sanctions opposed over your help of our campaign. We're going to take care of this and then lying about it. Uh, so I think it's that context that is so significant. Uh, and the fact that he wasn't doing on this on his own, that others within the top of the transition uh, were knowing of it, and indeed the president might have been knowing of it. The best way to explain the president's reaction when he ultimately did fire Flynn, and the fact that he wasn't upset with Flynn, and the fact that he waited so long to fire him in the first place, and that what he was really upset was the press exposing the lie, would suggest, I think, that the president was knowing of exactly what Flynn did. Uh, and the question, I think, for Bob Mueller and for us in Congress is, was this directed by the president? And if it uh, and was? If so what are the consequences of that? And if Michael Flynn were to testify that this, these contacts with the Russians were directed by the president? What would that tell you? Because we all know that during transitions, administrations have contacts with foreign officials all the time. Well, what that would tell me is that uh, one of the reasons that he was intervening, the president, that is, with James, Com uh, with James Comey, was that he knew that this would come to light uh, and that uh, he wanted to protect Mike Flynn lying on his behalf. Uh, and then you do get very close to a case of obstruction of justice. So uh, I think that's the significance of this context in which uh, the president was intervening. The more that he was involved in directing this, in being knowledgeable of it, uh, I think the stronger the potential case of obstruction becomes. We did see the president come out yesterday. And so there you have the obstruction of justice charge laid out again, uh, pretty simply, pretty strongly, uh, based on some speculation as to what Michael Flynn may say as to how he was directed. Uh, you know, ABC was at one point reporting that uh, a confidant of Michael Flynn's had said Donald Trump directed him during the campaign to contact the Russians. Uh, that was a Brian Ross report. I actually tweet, uh, uh, retweeted it with a message, you know, if this is true, it means that Trump's a target of the investigation. And then that tweet from ABC was deleted, and Brian Ross has been uh, suspended for four weeks without pay for not corroborating that report well enough Uh Apparently, it was not during the campaign. It was during the transition, which makes a big difference uh, in terms of, I mean, transition officials uh, often, you know, uh, contact the people in foreign countries to start, you know, start setting up relationships. Uh, that's not quite the same thing as uh, during the campaign, because during the campaign, it would be more about... Uh, the whole collusion factor, although uh, I'll get to the collusion issue uh, in just a minute when, in one of the other clips I'm going to show you. The, I just showed you two clips of the ranking Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee. The next two clips are from the ranking Democrat on the Senate Intelligence Committee, Mark Warner. This is on CNN's State of the Union talking to Jake Tapper. And uh, remember, I showed you the introduction from Jake Tapper where... He uh, was pretty clear that the president is is a liar. Uh, that was 
uh, not even the subtext. That was just like the text, the twist the truth, I think is what he said. But pretty clear the president's a liar. And so uh, this is a pretty softball question, I think, to Senator Mark Warner from uh, Jake Tapper here as to this uh, conflict between the president saying that uh, he never told James Comey to uh, lay off the prosecution of uh, Michael Flynn and uh, Comey having testified to that uh, before Mark Warner's uh, Senate committee. And so Jake Tapper asked him, who do you believe, Comey or Trump? And uh, I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of James Comey, but uh, in terms of a credibility face off between Comey and Trump, uh, Trump has real credibility problems, as I think Mark Warner explains with uh, corroborating evidence as well over in this clip. So first, you, let's, let's just start with this claim. He, he said, President Trump says he never asked Comey to stop investigating Flynn. Um, as you know, better than I, Comey testified under oath before your committee in June that President Trump did ask him to drop the investigation. Whom do you believe? I believe FBI Director Comey. I think he was very credible in his testimony and his private meetings with us. And it's not just Comey. You've had Clearly, you've had an attorney general who's had to recuse himself because of untold contacts with Russians. You had the president of the United States trying to intervene, as has been reported, with other national intelligence leaders who he appointed, saying, could you back off? We've had reports this week that he reached out to, your colleague. surprised by this, members of Congress yeah. saying, back off. This president has been obsessed with this investigation, always saying there's nothing there, but each week, Another shoe drops where we see more evidence of continuing outreach from Russians and some res response from the Trump campaign or, and Trump individuals. In the case of Flynn, you have somebody who is his top security advisor, then his national security advisor, have a series of contacts with Russian officials beginning in early December with the president's son-in-law asking for back-channel connections to Russia, then efforts to try to intervene in American politics before they take over in terms of backing Russia off from a UN vote over Israel, then trying to get Russia to back off in terms of response to President Obama's sanctions. And now the president somehow saying <clears throat> he didn't, he, he fired Flynn because he, uh, knew Flynn was lying to Pence. Well, if he knew that then, why didn't he act on it earlier? It raises a whole series of additional questions. Well, let me ask you about that tweet. I quote, I had to fire General Flynn because he lied to the vice president and the FBI. He has pled guilty to those lies. It's a shame because his actions during the transition were lawful. There was nothing to hide. That would seem to suggest that President Trump knew uh, that Michael Flynn uh, had lied to the FBI, which is, of course, a crime um, when he fired Flynn and also when he, according to Comey, asked Comey to back off. That seems to be in the territory of obstruction of justice. And again, that's why I think you're going to see much more coming from the special prosecutor. Clearly, General Flynn and his son was in a great deal of legal jeopardy. The fact that General Flynn was only charged with one account, a major account, lying to the FBI, I, I believe means that there's many more stories that General Flynn will have to tell about his time during the campaign and during the transition. So I think there's, there's more to come. And what we see here is this president, whenever any of his close associates uh, falls into problems, he tries to disassociate. So the other individual, Mr. Papadopoulos, he tries to dismiss, again, somebody who's already pled guilty. His campaign manager, his deputy campaign manager, Mr. Manafort and Mr. Gates, who've been indicted, he tries to ba back them off. Now they're even trying to call General Flynn, I hear. The White House has said this former Trump Obama, Obama, Obama appointee. Remember, General Flynn was someone who led the Republican convention in a very inappropriate, you know, lock her up kind of chant. This guy, Flynn, was completely tied in to the Trump operation throughout the campaign and then was national security advisor. How many people can this president continue to dismiss, quick, particularly as the circle gets closer and closer, even to family members? President Trump um, did... Uh even to family members, I think that's a, a reference to Jared Kushner, the son-in-law of Donald Trump, who, as I was saying earlier, could be the next domino to drop, especially given that he's one of the people who apparently directed Michael Flynn to make these contacts uh, with the Russians that he then lied about to the FBI for reasons that have not yet become clear. Uh, I think 
that uh, Mark Warner didn't do as good a job as Adam Schiff, his uh, house counterpart, uh, in the clips I showed talking to George Stephanopoulos. Uh, I think Jake Tapper had to do a little bit more of the work uh, bringing up obstru obstruction of justice there. And uh, I think, um, like I said, that was kind of a softball question as well. And then this next uh, clip with Mark Warner on CNN State of the Union uh, this is about uh, the clip you saw, I think, a couple times in the news summaries where uh, Trump on his way out to, of town uh, to New York to go to this fundraiser. He was asked and he said that, you know, they're very happy because uh, no collusion, absolutely no evidence of collusion. And then uh, Jake Tapper asks Mark Warner if there is evidence of collusion. And he talks about some of the contacts with Russia, but doesn't make a, an important point about evidence of collusion that uh, I would make uh, and I will make after we watch that uh, final Mark Warner clip together over here. President Trump um, did say this on Saturday when asked uh, about the Trump, uh, I'm sorry, without, when asked about the Flynn uh, plea deal. Take a listen. What has been shown is no collusion, no collusion. There's been absolutely, there's been absolutely no collusion. Is there any evidence of collusion? Is there any evidence of the Trump campaign and the Russians having some sort of agreement on how Russia can help the Trump team during the campaign? Let's again just go through the facts. We've had an FBI director who's been fired because of the president's intervention. We had the attorney general had to recuse himself because of his many contacts with Russians he didn't reveal. We've had a series of these other individuals indicted or pleading guilty already. We also have mounting evidence almost every week of additional contacts between the Russian government or Russian officials and officials connected to the Trump campaign under the guise of trying to improve relations. But as we look back at that meeting in June, that included Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, Paul Manafort, where there were constant overtures from Russians to say, hey, we've got dirt on Hillary Clinton. We want to share that with the Trump campaign. Now, we've got more dots to connect. We've got to finish our investigation. So it's still circumstantial. I'm gonna, I'm, no, no actual concrete proof listen, yet. I'm not going. I'm going to reserve my final judgment until we have all these individuals in to see us. But there is never, there has never been in modern American history a political campaign that had this much outreach to a foreign government and a foreign adversary in this case throughout the campaign and throughout the transition. I want to get to taxes in a second, but I do want to... So, you know, uh, Senator Mark Warner's answer there was okay as far as it went and what he said at the end about the outreach to a foreign government, a foreign adversary, that was, you know, that was true and disturbing. But uh, what he didn't say, the important response to the whole no collusion argument or the whole question of collusion that uh, people on the right sometimes bring up is there actually is no crime of collusion that that's not what Robert Mueller he's not going to indict anyone for collusion now there are crimes involving uh, accepting help in your campaign from a foreign government or even any foreign national like uh, I said earlier, if you look down in the video description, I've put a link to the statute that makes it a crime to accept anything of value from a foreign national other than like a permanent legal resident, like green card holders can contribute to political campaigns, but you can't accept something of value, which includes opposition research, dirt on Hillary Clinton. If you accept that as a contribution to the Trump campaign, uh, you know, the, the work of, you know, Russian agents to uh, dig up dirt on Hillary Clinton, that's opposition research, that's something that you would normally pay for if someone hands that to you for free, uh, then, or maybe it's a quid pro quo for changing uh, U.S. policy, but that would also be a violation of the Logan Act, that's another crime that could have been, it's never been successfully prosecuted, I think, the last prosecution at all of the Logan Act was in 1802. That's the act that says that, you know, the president is in charge of foreign policy, so private, citizen, <clears throat> private citizens cannot uh, engage in uh, 
conducting U.S. foreign policy, pretending they have the authority to conduct foreign policy. Now, it's a little bit more of a gray area in the transition period, but uh, still before, you know, there's only one president at a time. And when Obama was president, uh, Michael Flynn shouldn't have been making deals with the Russians to change their vote on U.N. resolutions about Israel or uh, promising sanctions. And anyway, so that's another possible crime. And then there's the crime of obstruction of justice. And I, like I said, there are several resources down in the video description about obstruction of justice. Uh, no crime of collusion, but those crimes, accepting uh, something of value from a foreign national to your campaign, uh, <clears throat> possibly the Logan Act, although that is a, a kind of dubious statute of dubious constitutionality and no one's ever been successfully prosecuted. No one's been prosecuted in over 200 years under that. So uh, I don't know if that's the strongest uh, crime, but obstruction of justice, very strong, possibly depending on what Michael Flynn has to say. And uh, there, I, I'm going to show one more clip before I get to the tax issue, and I'll also have a bonus Sandy photo. Sandy's not even here. Sandy's over in her bed because um, it's the middle of the night. I was delayed by this ACLU thing I went to earlier in the day That uh, that's like three and a half hours of driving and a couple hours to be there, so that's why I'm delayed like five or six hours or whatever. Anyway, uh, the next and final clip on the Russia topic I'm showing is my California Senator Dianne Feinstein talking both about impeachment and obstruction of justice and whether uh, Donald Trump is fit to be president. And she comes very close to saying he's not fit to be president based on a realization she came to about a month ago. I don't know. That's right around the time she got a primary opponent in California. I don't know if that was the... Uh, uh, the event a month ago that happened that made her suddenly realize she should say Donald Trump is unfit to be president when uh, <clears throat> Kevin DeLeon, in, who was actually at this event that I went to today, when he uh, said that he was going to challenge Dianne, Dianne Feinstein for uh, the, her Senate seat, maybe that's why she started seeing Donald Trump as unfit to be president. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, she also says something in this clip I've watched it several times and I can't figure out what is she trying to say where she talks about how, well, we're putting together a bunch of facts and those facts are very close to being evidence or something like that. Maybe she means evidence of a crime. Is that what she forgot to say? But I've listened to it like three times already. I'll watch it with you now uh, for the fourth time. Uh, I actually edited together two different clips of Dianne Feinstein talking about impeachment and talking about Donald Trump's unfitness or lack of fitness to be president uh, and listen for her talking about we're putting together facts that might be evidence or close to being evidence and you can tell me down in the comment section if you can figure out what Diane Feinstein is saying in the final clip on the Russia topic over here. I'll reference those quick graphics um, yesterday but just at face value and we know that the White House has tried to walk back both the KT McFarland email um, that seemed to imply that that they are as fact that the Russians did this. And of course, the president apparently admitting to potentially obstructing justice. They've walked all those back. But do you look at that? What does that say to you, these two, even call them mistakes? Is it sort of uh, accidental admissions in your mind? Well, let me begin by saying this. Uh, as you know, I'm ranking on Judiciary, and the Judiciary Committee has an investigation going as well. Uh, and it involves obstruction of justice. And I think what we're beginning to see is the putting together of a case of obstruction of justice. I think we see this in the indictments, mm -hmm. the four indictments and pleas. Uh, that have just taken place in some of the comments that have, are being made. Uh, I see it in the hyperphonetic uh, attitude of the White House, the comments every day, the continual tweets. The, um, uh, and I, I see it most importantly in what happened uh, with the firing of uh, Director Comey. And it is my belief that that is directly because he did not agree uh, to lift the cloud mm -hmm. of the Russia investigation. That's obstruction of justice. You know, the president, there's uh, a, a 
campaign ad that's running a lot in California and some on cable by somebody who may be an opponent of yours in a Senate race, a, a man by the name of Tom Sire. Let me play an excerpt of the ad. People in Congress and his own administration know that this president is a clear and present danger who's mentally unstable and armed with nuclear weapons, and they do nothing. There's been some implication here that he's uh, that the ad's directed at you because you took a more cautionary note when asked about the idea of impeachment. Where are you on that? And is the obstruction of justice case that you laid out pretty um, succinctly earlier um, with me, is that an impeachable offense? Well, in the first place, I, I just told you, I happen to be ranking on judiciary, right. which means I'm the lead Democrat on this. I'm trying to be very careful as to what I say and what I do. Um, we uh, have to put together facts that are solid, mm -hmm. uh, that are very close to evidence, if not evidence, and also draw some conclusions and possibly do some legislation. So this is a process that's ongoing. Now, I'm not without the powers of observation right. or seeing what's going on around me or watching the day-by-day -day, uh, episodes go by. Uh, the concern rises with the day. Um, the concern about this White House the concern rises. About the president. Your with concern it. about this president's ability to do the job rises by the day? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, I've been here for 25 years now. Um, there is a kind of instability, unpredictability. It's one issue after the other. We've got major problems in the world with our allies now, yeah. uh, in the Middle East, with North Korea. Um, it goes on and on, and I think that this president um, is just precipitating uh, more and more angst that's going to lead to serious discord. What did, when do you hitch your enough is enough moment? Well, it, it happened about a month ago, and I can't give you any particular event. Mm -hmm. But it happens, you know, those of us that are here so you think he should, understand you need to get him out of how the White House functions. And as you begin to see, uh, one day it's one story, the next day it's another story, the third day it's another story. It's very concerning to get at the truth. So, it, I mean, you just said you've hit your point. Do you believe it's time to think about getting him out of office? I believe it's time for us to finish our investigation. Okay. And I don't want to bias any part of the investigation with premature thinking. Right. Uh, I think that's very important. Okay, Senator Feinstein, I'm going to have to leave it there. As always, I never have enough time for everything Thank I'm you. to get to. It's Thanks good for to coming. see you. <laughs> so, I don't know. It is around a month ago when uh, Diane Feinstein was challenged by Kevin DeLeon, uh, the uh, president pro tem of the California State Senate here. Uh, that is around the time that she apparently started getting the feeling that maybe Donald Trump was unfit for office and she might, maybe she should start talking about that a little more, but maybe that's just a coincidence. And uh, what she was saying about how we're, we're putting together facts and those facts are solid, uh, solid facts that are something like evidence or close to being evidence or I don't know, maybe she meant evidence of a crime or evidence of obstruction of justice or evidence of high crimes and misdemeanors. I, I don't know, but there was definitely something missing uh, from her explanation there. But maybe you can help me fill in the blank down in the comment section. Uh, and that's the last clip on the Russia scandal. I'm going to have a few clips on the tax bill passed by the Senate, starting with a Saturday Night Live clip. But I think this is a good uh, point to put in my bonus Sandy clip. Uh, uh, you know, Sandy's not there, but I did take a picture of Sandy uh, where she was looking too tired to get out of her bed because it's after midnight now here where I am in California. I, I do appreciate the live viewers and the fans who uh, have uh, joined me in the middle of the night here. Uh, so before I show the Sandy clip, uh, let me show the two Super Chat contributions that I've gotten uh, so far uh, even though I'm doing this at such a weird time, I have like over 150 people watching and So two Canadian dollars there from F. I'm sorry. I don't remember all those numbers there or uh, sexy Bob's two American dollars thanking me for doing the show I 
hope uh, Sexy Bob, your employment situation will be improving. Uh, and for the Sandy fans out there, uh, you can see Sandy too tired to get out of her bed and come over uh, and lie down uh, next to to be my one live viewer, uh, live studio audience. She's still lying over in her bed, but she's still very cute. So that's uh, the only Sandy clip I can... That's my Sandy photo I took uh, right before the show started. She wouldn't get out of her bed, but... So uh, now I'll get on to the topic of the tax plan, the tax reform passed by the Senate that now goes to conference committee uh, with uh, the bill passed by the House. Uh, possibly even in the next week they'll have some uh, compromise between the House and the Senate bills uh, that they can both pass and get to President Trump and he'll finally sign some major piece of legislation. Uh, and I'll have a few clips on that and some uh, summaries of the difference between the House and the Senate bill and some questions about uh, it's uh, cost probably about a trillion dollars. It's going to add at least, I mean, maybe a trillion and a half, maybe half a trillion or, you know, depending on whose analysis you believe. But it's definitely going to add a lot of money to the deficit over the, less, uh, over the next 10 years. And it uh, doesn't even give everyone in the middle class a tax cut. It really focuses on corporations and of course, uh, rich people when they die, uh, and I'll talk about that a little more uh, when I get to the news clips, but first, here is uh, a couple jokes from Colin Jost and Michael Che on Weekend Update, specifically on the tax plan, which I will discuss with you after we watch that one-minute clip together over here. The Senate also voted to pass a $1.5 trillion tax reform bill early this morning that experts say would add over $1 trillion to the national debt. Wow, I knew Trump was going to run the country like a business. I just didn't know he was going to run it like one of his businesses. <laughs> Experts also say the plan will give huge tax cuts to households making over $1 million a year. Of course, all that money will eventually trickle down, first from rich parents to their kids, and then from those kids to their Molly dealers at Coachella. <laughs> Yo, know, once the Republicans get this tax bill passed, they won't need Donald Trump anymore. I mean, they already got what they wanted. You know, I mean, it's like, it's not like they like you. Don't you think it's a little odd that they passed this bill at 2 a.m. without reading it the same night they found out Flynn was snitching on you? They know something. It's like your family showing up to your hospital room saying, look, you need to sign this will tonight. <laughs> Can I read it first? No time. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a kind of a funny analysis that I've heard some serious pundits talk about the possibility that now that uh, Republicans have their tax bill or almost have it. it there's some possibility it won't pass still which i'll get to at the end the the last clip i'm showing is from susan collins talking about how she might not actually vote for the compromise bill between the house and the senate but uh so there is some possibility it won't pass but uh if it does pass as michael Che pointed out there and i've heard some serious pundits say that um at once republicans get their tax bill out of donald trump they don't really need him anymore and they can start uh, breaking with him and criticizing him more and uh, I don't know if that's true or not uh, I mean I did talk in previous weeks about how <clears throat> if uh, they didn't get this tax bill that that would be the point <clears throat> where you know what's the wh why should they stick with Donald Trump they that's the one thing that they wanted from him and if they don't get their tax cuts for the rich then uh, what what good is he anyway with and he's a big problems in a lot of ways but <clears throat> excuse me but um i hadn't really thought of it in the opposite way where uh what if they actually do pass it then also they don't need him but i don't know i i kind of have to think about that a little more but you can let me know you you think about it down in the comment section and <clears throat> now i want to get to that clip i promised of mitch mcconnell responding to senator john tester's viral video about uh, the last thing Michael Che was talking about, kind of like, uh, do I have time to read the will before I sign it? No, you got to sign it right now. That was basically what they did with the tax plan, where uh, they basically got it within a couple hours of when they had to vote on it, and there were all these changes scribbled into the margins, and 
that's what George Stephanopoulos asked Mitch McConnell, and uh, I guess I can do my Toby Turbo, <laughs> Turbo, uh, my to Toby the Turtle impression. I'm sorry, it's uh, almost 1 a.m. here where I am in California right now, but uh, he, you know, uh, George Stephanopoulos uh, shows a clip of John Tester uh, showing the scribbled stuff in the margins and saying, you know, uh, this isn't regular order, which supposedly Mitch McConnell is uh, such a big advocate of regular order and, uh, you know, uh, Mitch McConnell just... Uh, in his uh, turtle-like way, he's just, you know, yup, this was an open process, uh, yup, yo. they had every opportunity to add their amendments, uh, yup, uh, okay, there's my Toby the Turtle impression, and you can see the actual Mitch McConnell answer that, uh, I don't know if I buy it, but you can tell me if you buy it in the two-minute clip from ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos this morning over here. As you know, the Democrats also hitting you on the process. I want to show this video that went viral over the weekend from Senator John Tester of Montana. It's the night we're, we're going to be voting on the tax bill. I just got the tax bill 25 minutes ago. This is the tax bill. See how thick it is? Here's the modifications that are in it. I can read one word. It's called add this language. Can you tell me what that word is? If you can, you got better eyes than me. <laughs> do you know the answer to that, Senator? And do you even know who wrote that addition to the bill? <laughs> Look, the Democrat, if, if the Democrats were going to disqualify uh, senators from voting on a bill that had some uh, minor insertions, they, none of them would have been able to vote on the bill because this is fairly often the case. There's no hide the ball here. This is an open process. The vast majority of the bill has been online for two weeks. There were always, in big bills like this, some last-minute adjustments, some of them done actually by hand. There were no hearings very small, on the bill. Uh, very, oh, yeah, there were tons of hearings over and over and over. The Democrats went to them. The Democrats were, had the opportunity to offer amendments in, in committee. They had offered, offered an opportunity to, to offer amendments on the floor. For example, they were complaining about our repealing uh, the individual mandate in Obamacare in this bill, but none of them offered an amendment. Uh, to take it out. They had plenty of opportunity. They decided it was important to them politically to oppose this tax measure and take that to the American people. And we're prepared to do that. You're prepared because to, we you... think the country's been we think the country's been underperforming and we believe this will get the country performing better, providing jobs and opportunity for vast numbers of people who've been displaced during the Obama years. You may be prepared to do that, but as you know, right now the bill is... <laughs> so, I don't know. Do you buy Mitch McConnell's explanation? Well, I mean, if you really know the facts, I mean, some of this stuff they did have hearings on over the years, but there was a lot of stuff uh, stuffed into the bill at the last minute, and uh, the reason, uh, you know, they, as you'll see, uh, the best argument against what Mitch McConnell said in that last clip is actually in this next clip, which is why I paired them together. Uh, it's uh, independent Senator Angus King from Maine, who caucuses with the Democrats. I'll have the other senator from Maine in uh, just a few minutes, uh, Susan Collins, giving a little bit of hope that this tax bill won't pass because it's such a big giveaway to corporations and to the rich through the uh, estate tax uh, repeal that may or may not happen because that's the difference between the House and Senate bills, uh, which I'll get to with the John Barrasso clip on Fox News Sunday before the Susan Collins clip. But before those last two clips, this is the third to last clip, Senator Angus King uh, talking about not just how the process was bogus, but the stuff that was scribbled in the margins and added in the last few minutes uh, or in the last couple of hours was stuff no one had ever seen before and is going to start to come out as like special interest giveaways. You'll see he uh, references this one oil and gas giveaway that he doesn't know uh, what it's about and then he has uh, predictions as to what's going to happen in the future with this bill assuming it passes which he gives like a 50-50 chance it may not pass which I, I don't know. It, it would be, certainly be better for the country if it didn't pass, but it might in some ways be better for Democrats if it does pass because it's such an unpopular bill that uh, Democrats will be able to uh, 
beat Republicans over the head with in 2018. So it's a great political issue, but it's really bad tax, fiscal, economic policy, uh, and it has these weird, really uh, bad uh, special interest giveaways that Senator Angus King of Maine talks about on Face the Nation, talking to John Dickerson this morning over here. Majority Leader says uh, regular order was followed on this tax bill. What's your response? If that was regular order, I'd hate to see something else. This is the bill I brought it. This is the bill that we got at about 6 o'clock at night that we were going to vote on that night. There were no hearings. There were some general hearings about tax reform. There were zero hearings on the bill. And, and even the bill that was reported out by the Finance Committee, it was different than what we were handed, that we had to vote on a few hours later. And what worries me about this, I, I commandeered a staffer's desk right off the floor uh, Friday night and read it all the way through. Now, I can't say I understood all of it, but you could do the things that we were talking about, reducing corporate tax rates, doubling the standard deduction, in maybe 50 pages. This is 477 pages, John. There's a lot of stuff in here that I don't think anybody knows what it's all about. I just happened to pick up, I marked in the margin on page 409, domestic oil and gas extraction income. What's that all about? There's a later provision about income on oil and gas from foreign countries. What's that all about? The point is, nobody knew what was going on here. And there was a moment when we could have fixed it. Chuck Schumer moved to, to recess Friday night about 9 o'clock to Monday. Give people a chance to go through this and dig through it. Party line vote denied. We ended up voting at 3 a.m. Senator McConnell said Friday night, he said, you know, when you're complaining about the process, it means you're losing. Well, I, I think there is, I mean, there's a point there because I heard him complain about the process a lot when I first arrived. But um, at, at some point, process matters. I mean, the, the 86 tax bill, 33 hearings, 10 months. The vote in the Senate, by the way, was 90 to 10. This one barely was dragged across the finish line on a party line vote. So what happens now? Well, I'm, you know, there's a lot of talk about what the conference will be. I, I give it 50-50, there'll be no conference. I think there's a chance because I don't think that either side wants to take the, either the House or the Senate wants to bring this back to the floor. Mm -hmm. uh, they, the House just may take the Senate bill and send it to the president. So uh, what happens now is we've now made a 30-year decision. This, is, this may be the most important vote any of us take in our, in our career because this isn't the reauthorization of the FAA or even the farm bill. This is something that's going to affect every American, every business, the whole economy for uh, uh, decades. And what happens now is uh, we're going to see, well, I'll give you three predictions. I got three predictions. Right, one, is, one is you're going to see people put on their long, serious face, as Orrin Hatch did this morning, and say, the deficit's really a problem. We can't do SNAP or Social Security or Medicare. We got to restructure. That's number one. That's the first prediction. Two, we're going to find some really stinky stuff in here that we didn't know. Mm -hmm. And three, anything good that happens in America in the next year, including good weather at the Super Bowl, is going to be attributed to this bill. Those are my predictions. All right. We're going to come back and talk to you, Senator, on the other side of the commercial. We'll be back. So I like Senator Angus King's three predictions. Uh, I like the way he took the process argument about all the stuff scribbled in at the last minute and turned it into a substance argument with, you know, what are these special interest giveaways that they scribbled into the margins, including this oil and gas giveaway. And there are tons of different special interest giveaways that, according to his three predictions there, uh, should be coming out uh, over uh, the next short period of time, especially as they come up with the reconciliation between the House and Senate bill. We'll be finding out all the stinky stuff they added in there, and that should make the bill even... Uh, less attractive to voters and uh, the one thing he said the his first prediction there uh, about uh, how they're also going to use this to uh, say that you know we have these deficits so uh, we can't do this or we can't do that thing you know you know now we're worried about the deficits that's the closest I saw on the Sunday morning news analysis shows to something I saw like on AM joy though Joy and Ru Joy Reed is in trouble in a couple different. I saw she was in trouble saying some anti-gay things. She was in trouble uh, getting in a feud with uh, Bernie Sanders' wife this week. But uh, I still watched AM Joy this week, and uh, 
uh, at least on Saturday, and then I listened to it in the car while I was driving back and forth to this ACLU event earlier today that took up like five hours of my time I was talking about earlier. But uh, on that show, I heard them talking about how Marco Rubio was setting up, uh, Marco Rubio, senator from Florida, gave away the idea that there is this step two to this uh, big tax cut uh, when they start creating these extra deficits by giving away a trillion dollars in, uh, you know, they, they're not paying for this tax cut for the rich and for the corporations. Uh, you know, it's going to create an extra trillion dollars, $1.5 trillion possibly in uh, deficit that gets added to the debt over the next 10 years. And uh, Marco Rubio uh, gave away the idea that uh, the, uh, that they're going to then come to step two where they say, oh, we've got these big deficits, we have to cut spending, and that's not discretionary spending, that's the entitlement spending, which is Medicare and Social Security, and there's going to be a big cut, especially for the people after the baby, boomer, baby boomers who are retiring now, uh, people who haven't retired yet, they're going to get this big debt from the tax cut and then they're basically all their retirement benefits are going to be taken away by the Republicans. That's the big step too. And uh, Senator Angus King in that last clip sort of alluded to that, but I, I was uh, a little disappointed that the Sunday morning news analysis shows uh, did not talk about that a little more. Uh, Joy Reid on AM Joy did on MSNBC, despite her problems with uh Bernie Sanders and his wife and uh, with, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Governor Crist in Florida saying some anti-gay things about him. Uh, but I have uh, two more clips on the tax issue that I want to show you. First uh, is from Fox News Sunday where they actually talk about the differences between the House and the Senate bills with uh, Senator John Barrasso and how that's going to turn out which is a setup for the Susan Collins clip at the end where Susan Collins says she may actually change her vote and vote against the tax bill if they don't get the compromise she wants. But first, here's uh, what that compromise is going to look like from Fox News Sunday. Chris Wallace talking to Senator John Barrasso, uh, which I'll talk about with you after we watch that clip together here. The Senate passed the Republican tax bill early Saturday morning along party lines. But there are some big differences between the House and Senate plans. On individual taxes, the House tax cuts are permanent while they expire after 2025 in the Senate bill. On corporate taxes, the House cuts the top rate from 35 to 20 percent in 2018. The Senate waits till 2019. Joining us now live from Washington, Wyoming, Senator John Barrasso, head of the Republican Policy Committee. Senator, uh, as we have just noted, there are several differences between the House and Senate plans that have to be reconciled before a bill can go to the president. I want to put up what may be perhaps the two biggest that are creating the sharpest differences in the Senate plan. Most tax cuts for individuals, as we said, expire in 2026. And the Senate plan does not repeal the estate tax House conservatives say that both of those are unacceptable. So how is that going to get worked out? Well, first, Chris, thanks for having me. Let me take a step back to say a year ago, the American people voted for fundamental change in this country, and tax reform is a very big part of it, people wanting to keep more of their hard-earned money. And that's what you see in the bills that passed both the House and the Senate. Absolutely, there are some changes. They still need to be made in conference to work these things out. The other thing that you haven't mentioned, the big differences are the Republican bill in the Senate eliminates the mandate of Obamacare. It takes Obamacare from being a mandatory program to a voluntary program. And, and yes, I like the idea of making the, the uh, taking away the death tax entirely. You know, the other thing that we're doing in terms of helping stimulate the economy, uh, President Trump talks about energy dominance for America, and we allow more energy exploration in an area of Alaska that's been off limits for a long time. So, so, I hope so those briefly, are included. So, so briefly, I mean, there are some things that you're saying you like better in the Senate plan, some things you like better in the House plan, but you only passed it in the Senate with one vote to spare. So uh, the, the question is, is this going to be a give and take where you'll take some of one and some of the other, or is the House basically going to have to swallow the Senate plan? 
Well, there's going to be a conference committee. The members from the House and the Senate will get together to look for the best solutions. But we're not that far apart. Fundamentally, for the American public, we double, double the standard deductions, double the child tax credits. We lower the rates. And in terms of investing in America and in, and in an American first economy, we lower tax rates for Main Street businesses all across the country, as well as corporations to make us much more competitive internationally. So investments are made in America and not overseas. Well, let, let, let. <laughs> so that is the discussion between Chris Wallace and Senator John Barrasso as to how the House and Senate bills are going to be reconciled. Uh, you notice partway through that clip, there was an interesting discussion about uh, oil and gas exploration. Uh, what Senator John Barrasso was talking about there is I, I heard that they're opening up the uh, uh, Arctic uh, National Wildlife Refuge for oil drilling even though it at the price of oil right now it's not even economically uh, uh, profitable you know, it's the like politicians who want to open up the refuge and not really the oil companies so much and I don't know if that's the same thing Angus King was talking about the scribbled stuff for in the margins for oil companies but maybe that'll come out in the next week uh, <clears throat> but you saw that uh, they're definitely big differences including the estate tax that's one of the biggest giveaways to the rich uh, because the, I don't know if everyone knows about that but uh, right now the estate tax only applies to estates that uh, for it's like five and a half uh, million dollars for individuals or eleven million dollar estates for couples so basically it, if your estate is less than $11 million and you're, you know, a, a normal couple giving to your children, uh, this doesn't apply to you. It's only for the super rich. And, uh, you know, some people say it's double taxation, but it, it's not actually the death that is taxed because if uh, you die and you give all your money away to uh, charities, there's no tax on your death. It's only it's the receipt of the money that's income the inheritance that's what's taxed if it's more than five and a half million or eleven million it's kind of like that joke i showed at the beginning uh from colin jost about how uh you know it goes from the rich to the children of the rich to the molly dealers of the children of the richer but it i don't know why it is that uh, we think that uh i mean talk about white privilege or uh, I mean, that's the, one of the biggest privileges of them all is the one percent who getting to pass on their uh, family wealth from generation to generation, where the you know later generations don't necessarily do anything to earn it, and it's not like uh, having a tax on the amount over eleven million dollars is such an onerous uh, uh, punishment to the subsequent generations so anyway you can let me know what you think about that down in the comment section but uh the final clip i want to show you is the one i promised of susan collins talking about how she might not vote for the final bill if they don't get the reconciliation between the house and the senate uh the way she likes it which is uh at least a little hope if, if you're if you want uh, what's good for the united states what's good for the future of the country uh, then you don't want this bill to pass. Like I said earlier, if you want a good issue for Democrats to beat up re Republicans in 2018, then uh, politically it's actually, I, I think it's a good thing for this bill to pass because it's such a bad, unpopular bill that has all this stinky stuff in it that Angus King was talking about. And it, it doesn't even really help the middle class. It's not a big tax cut for most people. It really targets corporations and the super rich and the estate tax and Anyway, here's uh, Susan Collins giving hope to those who hope that the bill won't pass in the final clip for tonight over here. Move to the tax bill. I want to move to the debt part first. Let me play a little mashup of what you've said about the debt in the past. Take a listen. And Senator Collins, you supported uh, President Obama on the stimulus package. Yes. Can you support his budget? No. Why not? Because it brings our debt levels to an unprecedented level. Our current debt is unsustainable. It's $14.3 trillion. And it is a threat to the future prosperity of this nation. All right. 
If the debt is unsustainable at 14 trillion, how do you, how did you make yourself comfortable voting for something that's going to increase the deficit, this tax bill? We're at 20.6 trillion now, and the best estimates say it's going to, even the best, the best estimates of dynamic scoring that we could find still add half a trillion dollars to the deficit. Economic growth produces more revenue and that will help to offset this tax cut and actually lower the debt. I even Where's the, the joint, evidence? Can I where well, explain let, to me find a find a study that actually says what you're claiming. It doesn't me, exist. Let me do that. First of all, if you take the CBO's formula mm -hmm. and apply it for just four tenths of one percent increase in the GDP generates revenues of a trillion dollars. A trillion dollars. Even the Joint Committee on Taxation has projected that the tax bill would stimulate the economy to produce hundreds of billions of additional revenue. I've talked to four economists, including the Dean of the Columbia School of Business mm -hmm. and former chairs of the Councils of Economic Advisors, and they believe that it will have this impact. So. I think if we can stimulate the economy, create more jobs, that that does generate more revenue. Well, why isn't there a single study? I'm going to show you three studies that we have, sort of a, 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 a liberal one, a, a centrist one, and a conservative one right up there. The most conser conservative one, the most pro-economic growth argument, still adds $516 billion to the deficit over 10 years. Well, talk to economists like Glenn Hubbard and uh, Larry Lindsay and uh, Douglas Holtz Eaton, who used to be head of the CBO, and they will tell you otherwise. So I think you will find that economists just don't agree on this. All right, you're comfortable with your vote on this tax bill, and is it there? really no matter what comes out of conference? No, I mean, obviously I want to see what comes out. I believe that the amendments that I added on medical expense deductions, on property tax deductions, okay. on helping retirement security for public employees improve the bill. I got a commitment that we're going to pass two bills, including the Alexander Murray bill and right. one that I've authored that will help offset the individual mandate repeal by lowering premiums and I also got an ironclad commitment that we're not going to see cuts in the Medicaid Medicare program as a result of this bill. All right we will uh, be watching that commitment that was made to you I'm curious. Hmm. Uh, so like I said that was the final clip there uh, and uh, Chuck Todd ends there by talking about the commitment that Mitch McConnell made to Susan Collins that was something he was act asked about in one of his appearances on the show in a clip I didn't take where he said he would uh, fulfill his commitments to Susan Collins that they bring up the uh, uh, Ale Lamar Alexander Patty Murray bill that uh, helps mitigate some of the damage going on with the health care system and uh, some of the other uh, assurances she got but uh, for those who think that uh, this bill is a great calamity for the United States economically which uh, there's strong evidence that that's a a uh, correct opinion, then uh, Susan Collins provides some hope there that she might not vote for what comes out of the conference between the House and the Senate. Uh, I thought Chuck Todd did a pretty good job in that last clip of uh, both uh, finding old clips of Susan Collins being worried about the debt and then all of a sudden not being worried about the debt and then also being ready for the uh, really stupid Republican argument about how, you know, growth is going to pay for, you know, tax cuts pay for themselves through economic growth. Well, you know, if that's true, why don't you just cut the taxes to zero and then you'll have like infinity economic growth, right? Or under that, like weird, uh, you know, uh, and he was already with the three different studies, the conservative middle of the road and or nonpartisan uh, joint study and then the uh, more conservative study that have like 1.5 trillion, 1 trillion, or at least uh, half a trillion dollars in uh, debt added over 10 years. And uh, Susan Collins, I don't think really had much to counter that. But anyway, like I said, that was the last clip. Uh, I noticed uh, I had uh, almost, what did it, it got up to almost 180, 180, 381. 
live viewers. Uh, now I have over 150, so I appreciate that in the middle of the night. Uh, uh, this is sort of a different uh, class of live viewers because I'm doing it at a different time because of this event earlier. That shouldn't happen for the next several weeks, but uh, the last couple Sundays in January, if you're watching now as a live viewer, I think January 21st and 28th, I have ACLU commitments that are going to push my show late, so those days, uh, it might be late on Sunday, early Monday again, somewhere in this time or even later, depending on uh, how long it takes me to get stuff put together. Uh, I appreciate those of you who join me for the live show, the additional Super Chat co contributions I got, uh, I think one from... Uh, oh, I got a couple more from Sexy Bob and one from, uh, what is that, Inuit2V? Uh, is that uh, one of my uh, Romanian viewers? I'm not sure if that, but it, those are all in U.S. dollars, so I appreciate uh, those additional $14 in Super Chat contributions. Uh, I hope uh, you appreciated the clips I picked out for you. Uh, next week I'll be back with uh, more Sunday news analysis show clips. Uh, more Saturday Night Live clips. The next couple of weeks there will be Saturday Night Live clips that I will be able to include in the show and uh, maybe next week it'll be Jared Kushner or some who, who wants to bet that uh, Jared Kushner's gonna be the next person, next domino to fall in the Robert Mueller investigation. Is that gonna happen this month? Uh, that, that would be uh, someone in Donald Trump's family. That would be uh, even a bigger development than Michael Flynn this week, which we were kind of expecting a few weeks ago when uh, Paul Manafort got indicted and uh, George Papadopoulos ended up being a cooperating witness. So I guess we'll see what happens. And uh, until I have some reason to make uh, an edited produced video, maybe this will be the week, although it's actually another really busy ACLU week this week. So I don't think that's going to happen, but next week, uh, next Sunday, I don't have any conflicts, and like I said, the next few sun for the rest of the De for the rest of December, no more conflicts. So uh, there won't be any more late shows in December, and I will be be back next Sunday and for the foreseeable future. And uh, I guess until then, uh, I will be seeing all of you around the internet.